What if Anakin managed to kill Sidious and become the Emperor? What would happen then? Let's find out. So in this new timeline, everything would be the same as it was in the original timeline until Obi-Wan takes the high ground and Anakin attempts to leap across Obi-Wan and kill his old master. And so, in this new timeline, Anakin will try to jump over Obi-Wan despite Obi-Wan's warning not to, and as he was in the air, Obi-Wan would strike Anakin. And as a result, Obi-Wan's blue saber would go through Anakin, but unlike in the original timeline, here, Obi-Wan would only manage to cut off Anakin's legs, leaving his one biological arm unharmed. Following this, Anakin would fall to the banks of the lava river they were fighting in moments ago. But here, since Anakin has both his arms, he'll be able to crawl further up the ground than he did in the original timeline. Which would of course not get Anakin any closer to Obi-Wan, but would keep the Chosen One from burning. As for Obi-Wan, he would say the same thing to his former apprentice as he did in the original timeline. And just like in the original timeline, Obi-Wan would consider going down the high ground and ending Anakin. But then, Obi-Wan would sense that the Emperor, Darth Sidious, was approaching, and that he had very little time to say Padme and leave Mustafar. Obi-Wan knew he couldn't beat Sidious, especially since at this moment, Obi-Wan believes that Yoda, the 900-year-old Grandmaster of the Jedi Order, to have been killed by Sidious. And so, in the end, Obi-Wan takes Anakin's saber and leaves, because he didn't have time to do anything else. And as Obi-Wan left, Anakin would watch with glowing yellow eyes. Shortly thereafter, Obi-Wan would reach Polis Massa with an unconscious Padme, C-3PO, and R2-D2. And just like in the original timeline, here too, Padme would die, and her body would be transported to Naboo, where her funeral would be held. But as for Luke and Leia, things would take a different turn than they did in the original timeline. Because here, since Obi-Wan and Yoda know that Anakin or Darth Vader still lives, instead of sending Leia to Alderaan and Luke to Tatooine, the two Jedi would decide to take them both to Dagobah to train them from as early as possible. Vader would become extremely powerful, and to defeat both Vader and his master Darth Sidious, the children of Skywalker would need to become the strongest possible versions of themselves, Yoda would reason. And so, Obi-Wan and Yoda would head on over to Dagobah with Luke and Leia. It wouldn't be just the four of them, of course. C-3PO, R2-D2, and many other droids would be there with them to help raise the two younglings. And on top of that, Bail Organa would always be there to help the two Jedi and their new hope with whatever they needed. And so, in this timeline, Luke and Leia would be trained from birth under the tutelage of Master Obi-Wan Kenobi and Master Yoda, so that one day, they could destroy the Sith and the Empire. And now, let's get back to Anakin Skywalker. So, no long after Obi-Wan left, Anakin would sense a dark presence very close to him. It was Darth Sidious. And soon after, Anakin felt his new master standing above him, at which point the Chosen One looked up and saw the disfigured face of Darth Sidious. Anakin then heard Sidious order the clones that were with him to bring him a medical capsule. And following this, as Anakin watched, Sidious would walk down to Anakin and kneel beside him. And at this moment, Anakin would sense something resembling pity in Sidious, which Anakin hated. And so, just like in the original timeline, here too, Sidious would take his new apprentice, or what was left of him, to one of the best medical facilities in the galaxy, the Grand Republic Medical Facility on Coruscant. There, Anakin would be sedated as he kept getting violent after not being told where Padme was. And as he was under sedation, Anakin would be given new legs. After which Sidious would come to see his new apprentice. Not directly, not in person. Instead, Sidious would appear through a hologram. Sidious does so because he had some very difficult news to share with Anakin. And Sidious knew that Anakin would attack him after hearing it. And this news in question was of course the death of Padme Amidala by Anakin's own hands. Also, a side note, in the original timeline, as revealed by the comic Darth Vader Imperial Machine, suited Vader does immediately attack Sidious after being told that Padme died, but Sidious uses Force Lightning to deal with Vader. But in this alternate timeline, even though he lost his legs, Anakin, or Vader by this point, was much more powerful than suited Vader, so Sidious was wise to take caution, as it wouldn't have been so easy to deal with this Vader, who by the way I will be referring to as Anakin throughout this video just to make things easier. Anyways, back to the story. So, once Sidious began observing Anakin and his new legs, Sidious would order the medical droids to bring Anakin out of sedation. The droids would do so, and as soon as he came to, Anakin noticed the hologram of Sidious and would demand to know where Padme was. To which Sidious would say, like in the original timeline, that in his anger, Anakin killed Padme. Hearing this, Anakin would go into denial, and immediately, he would be overcome with rage. At this point, Anakin would crush every single droid that was in his vicinity. You promised to save her, Anakin would yell. To which Sidious, in a gentle but firm tone, would say, In your anger, you chose a different path. 
And hearing this, Anakin's anger would grow further, and sensing this, Sidious would tell Anakin in an immensely confident tone that, with time, Padme can still be saved, as all things, however unnatural, are possible through the dark side of the Force. This would calm Anakin down just a little, enough for him to not want to kill Sidious immediately. So quick side note, in the original timeline, Sidious doesn't tell his apprentice anything about bringing Padme back to life, and that is because, like I mentioned before, Suited Vader was no threat to Sidious. But this one is, and had to be manipulated to be controlled. So that is why Sidious says Padme can be brought back, and Sidious wouldn't really be lying when he says this. Being brought back from the dead through the dark side is possible, as you will see soon in this video. Anyways, following Sidious' speak of resurrecting Padme, Anakin would tell Sidious that he wants to see her. Sidious would realize what he meant. Anakin wanted to see Padme one last time. And having realized this, Sidious would say that Padme's body was found in a clinic on Polis Massa. After which the officials on Polis Massa inform Coruscant, at which point Bail Organa, one of Padme's closest associates, went to Polis Massa and recovered Padme's body, taking her to her home planet of Naboo. Senator Amidala was most likely abandoned on Polis Massa by the Jedi who caused her death. At least, that is the official consensus on what happened, Sidious would tell Anakin, letting Anakin know in a subtle manner that the real cause of Padme's death has been hidden. And following this, Sidious would add that Padme's funeral was held on Naboo, and that due to his medical procedure, Anakin had to be placed under sedation during this. Which, by the way, wasn't true. Sidious had instructed the droids to keep Anakin sedated until he, Sidious, told otherwise, because Sidious wanted the very last memory Anakin had of Padme to be when he killed her because that pain would fuel the darkness inside Anakin for as long as Anakin lived, Sidious believed. So that is a real reason why Anakin was sedated during Padme's funeral. But Anakin, in the state he was in, would not realize this. Instead, as a response to Sidious, Anakin would simply let out a rage-filled scream. At this point, Sidious would tell him, his new apprentice, that together, they can and will bring Padme back. And a few moments after he said this, Sidious would sense hints of hope appearing in Anakin, and having sensed this, a sinister smile would form on Sidious's face as he realized that even in death, Padme will help him keep Anakin in line. In the days following this, just like in the original timeline, Sidious would announce to the Empire that Anakin's words are his, and that Anakin's command is second only to his own. Sidious does this to further Anakin's trust in Sidious, which he needed to keep Anakin from rebelling. And following all these official announcements regarding Anakin, Sidious would give Anakin a gift. The lightsaber of Grandmaster Yoda. Sidious would tell Anakin that Anakin will need a Sith lightsaber and that a Sith lightsaber is made red by bleeding the kyber crystal instead of a Jedi's lightsaber. Sidious would add that to completely transform into a Sith, Anakin would need to create his own Crimson Sith Saber by bleeding the crystal inside Grandmaster Yoda's lightsaber. What bigger insult to the Grandmaster of the Jedi Order than to have his own lightsaber be turned into a Sith Saber, Sidious would think. As for Anakin, he knew that he needed to become stronger on the dark side to bring Padme back, and that if he needed to make a red Sith lightsaber, to become stronger, so be it, Anakin would think. And so, letting his actions do the talking for him, Anakin would take Yoda's lightsaber from Sidious. And as he does so, Sidious would also tell Anakin, just like in the original timeline, that Anakin will need to bleed the crystal on Mustafar, because in addition to Anakin's experience on the planet, deep beneath the surface of Mustafar, rests a locus, or a focal point of the dark side, and a strong connection to the dark side is required to bleed the crystals, Sidious would say. When you arrive on Mustafar, find the place where the dark side calls to you, drop on the energy there, and combine it with your own. Then use it to corrupt the kyber crystal with your pain and anger, Lord Beta. Make them bleed. Sidious told Anakin. So, quick side note, in the original timeline, Sidious, instead of gifting Anakin a saber to bleed, sends Anakin off to find a Jedi, kill them, and then take their saber. But in this new timeline, Anakin is much stronger than suited Vader, and Sidious figured that Anakin wouldn't have the patience to go after any Jedi, as he was focused only on studying the dark side and getting stronger. And Sidious also knew that Anakin, in the state he was in, had to be handled with much care, which is why Sidious gives Yoda saber to his apprentice. Anyways, Back to the story. So after Sidious tells him of how he needs to bleed the crystal on Mustafar, Anakin would take Yoda's lightsaber and walk away. At which point Sidious would wonder if Darth Bane would have approved of a Sith lightsaber being a gift. But then Sidious would tell himself that Darth Bane may not have approved of a Sith apprentice getting their master drunk and then electrocuting them to death, which would make Sidious smile. 
And so, Anakin, following Sidious's advice rather than orders in this timeline, would arrive on Mustafar and would approach the section of the planet where the dark side called to him, as Sidious said. And in so doing, Anakin would end up in the Force Locus that Sidious spoke of. And once there, Anakin took out the crystal from Yoda's green lightsaber, and combining his own power with that of the Force Locus on Mustafar, Anakin would pour his hatred and anger into the Kyber crystal. And upon doing so, Anakin would be met with a vision. A vision where he turns back to the light side, defeats Sidious, and finally apologizes to Obi-Wan. But Anakin, of course, would reject this vision, and would again focus his pain and anger into the Kyber crystal. And ultimately, the crystal would stop resisting, and would turn red, producing a red-bladed saber. And after this whole ordeal, Anakin would sit there inside this cave on Mustafar, during which he would ponder on something that he realized as he blood the crystal. This force locus on Mustafar is not simply a place strong in the dark side. It's actually a portal into another dimension. A place where the impossible could be possible. This, by the way, is the same conclusion that Anakin arrives at in the original timeline as well. He ultimately realized that this locus on Mustafar is a door. A door into a dark side realm where the impossible can be made possible. This wouldn't be hard for Anakin to believe, especially given everything he saw on Mortis during the Clone Wars. And ultimately, believing that the dark side has shown him a way he could bring Padme back, Anakin would head back to the Imperial capital, to Coruscant, with his Sith Saber. After arriving on Coruscant, Anakin would immediately meet with Sidious and tell Sidious that he wants a personal residence built on Mustafar. Sidious would ask Anakin why he wants Mustafar, to which Anakin would say in a dismissive tone that he, Anakin, believes that impossible things can be achieved through the Force Locus on Mustafar. As Anakin said this, Sidious would again sense the hope in Anakin. Hope that maybe through the power of this Force Locus, Padme can be brought back. But believing Anakin's hope to mostly be folly, Sidious would grant Anakin his demand, a castle on Mustafar. But in addition to this, Sidious would give Anakin two other gifts. One would be Padme's ship, to strengthen Anakin's soul of the dark side. And the other gift would be far more important. Sidious would give Anakin the Mask of Darth Momin, who was an ancient Sith Lord whose spirit still possessed his mask. Sidious would say that Momin tried to use the Force in unusual ways, and that Momin's mask might help Anakin, since he too seeks unusual paths to the dark side. And so, as in the original timeline, after his meeting with Sidious, Anakin would immediately leave Coruscant on Padme's ship, with two Imperial Architects and the Mask of Darth Momin. In the original timeline, when Vader entered Mustafar, he turned off the Naboo starship's deflector shields to make the ship a reflection of his own burned body in a way. But here, since he is not under constant pain and anger, Anakin would not damage the ship. Instead, he would land on Mustafar and leave the architects to do their work as he, Anakin, went to the Force Locus to meditate. But as he did so, Anakin's meditation was interrupted by a loud scream. Anakin would rush out and quickly he would find the source of the scream. One of the architects that had arrived on Mustafar with him was lying dead from a blaster wound. And the other architect, as Anakin saw, was hard at work designing something while wearing the mask of Darth Momin. Anakin would then ignite his red lightsaber and point it at this entity. At this point, the mask would give Anakin a vision in which Anakin would see who Momin was, an ancient Sith who sought to worship the dark side through his art. Anakin would see that Momin died as he tried to please the dark side with an art project for which Momin had created a powerful force-powered machine that could annihilate a city. Momin flew this powerful weapon over a city, but the interesting aspect of this machine was that right as the people in the city that Momin was about to destroy with this machine would realize that they were about to die, Momin would use the force to slow time and freeze his victims in time as the expression of pure dread and impending doom took over their faces. This would be a creation worthy of the dark side, Momin thought. But as Anakin saw, Momin's plan was foiled by the Jedi, and he was killed. But Momin's mask survived, and was presumably taken to Coruscant, to the Jedi Temple. At this point, the vision would end, and like in the original timeline, Momin would ask Anakin what exactly Anakin wants from him. To which Anakin would ask about the design that Momin made, and in response, Momin would say that he knows what Anakin seeks, a way to open and pass into the Force Locus on Mustafar. Momin will continue and tell Anakin that the design Momin made is basically a key into this Force Locus. And having said this, Momin will also add that Anakin's beloved wife Padme awaits him on the other side 
of this door that Mormon's key would open. Anakin would ultimately believe this, mostly because he wanted to believe this, and Mormon, still possessing the body of the Imperial Architect, would begin work on building his key into the dark side, which was basically Vader's castle in the original timeline. And ultimately, after 8 redesigns, Mormon will be successful in building a castle that can tune the energies of the Force Locus, enabling Anakin to open the door into the other side. Also, in the original timeline, these experiments of suited Vader and Mormon was causing Mustafar surface and its creatures to become violent, which ultimately led to the natives of Mustafar launching an attack at Vader's castle right after Vader had successfully opened the door to the Dark Side Realm. Vader ultimately dealt with the attack, but that cost him time. Time which Mormon used to bring himself back to life. But in this new timeline, due to Anakin not killing Mormon's host body every time a design of Mormon's failed, the work was completed much faster, before the natives could launch an attack. And so, with the door to this dark side dimension now open, Anakin would walk in to bring Padme back. And as for Mormon, like in the original timeline, here too, Mormon wanted to bring himself back to life. That was Mormon's ultimate goal, not serving Anakin. So, when Anakin walked in, leaving Mormon outside, believing Mormon to be just a mask and of no threat, well, as soon as Anakin disappeared into the dark side realm, Mormon used the door to bring himself back to life, calling himself his masterpiece. Meanwhile, inside this dark side dimension, Anakin will see and hear many strange things. Things from the past and even things from the future. Eventually, Anakin would come upon what appears to be the Jedi Temple where many Jedi from his past would attack Anakin. And Anakin would defeat them all, even Yoda. Anakin would then continue walking into the temple where he would then see Sidious and Obi-Wan fighting. Sidious would beat Obi-Wan and then attempt to stop Anakin. But Anakin would use red force lightning to stop and kill Sidious. And after dealing with this apparition of Sidious, Anakin would keep walking and eventually, he would walk up to Padme. At this point, Anakin would plead with Padme to come back with him, but Padme would refuse, telling Anakin that she doesn't know him, and that Anakin Skywalker is dead. Padme would then fall off the balcony she was standing on, during which she would be struck by a bolt of lightning, and Anakin would see Padme die again. Anakin would scream, but to no avail. And moments later, he would get up and see something else. In the distance, three beings, would walk out of a blue beam of light. Anakin would watch as these beings ignited their lightsabers, one blue, one green, and one yellow. And as they ignited their sabers, Anakin would be ejected from this dark side dimension, and he would wake up inside his body, angry and sad. But Anakin wouldn't get much time to process what just happened, because upon returning to the land of the living, Anakin would find the resurrected Darth Mormon waiting for him. Do you know why you couldn't save her? Mormon would ask. You lied to me, Anakin would say. To which Mormon would ignite his lightsabers and attack Anakin. Anakin would of course block this attack with his own saber. At this point, Mormon would say the following. The dark side does not serve us. We serve the dark side. If we glorify it through our acts, our work, our art, it gives us power, it gives us life, even eternal. But if we do not serve, if we fight the will of the dark side, try to control it, well... Just look at you. The two will then continue their fierce duel, which Mormon will begin to gain the upper hand in. Anakin being weak from his journey into the dark side dimension would play a part in this. Anakin would keep getting tired as the fight went on, but Mormon, as Anakin would sense, wouldn't be getting as exhausted as Anakin. Mormon was newly born after all. And so, no long after, Anakin would fall to his knees before Mormon. But, before Mormon could strike Anakin down, Anakin would ask Mormon if he had indeed lied about it being possible to bring Padme back. As a response, letting his guard down for a moment, Mormon would answer, I did not. All things are possible to the Force. What you desire awaits you on the other side. But it will never be yours. The dark side will never allow it. You have been poorly taught about what the dark side is and why we must serve. Your master is either ignorant or hoarding knowledge, Mormon would say. Mormon would then go on about how Anakin is pathetic, but as he was saying all this, Mormon had assumed that he had won and that Anakin couldn't do anything to him. Overconfidence, a weakness that had ended many Sith, would be the detriment of Mormon as well, because as Mormon was distracted, lecturing Anakin, Anakin would execute a simple force push. 
which sent Momin back into the dark side realm he came from. And immediately before Momin could react, Anakin would cut down the focusing spires around the Force Locus, closing the door to the dark side realm before Momin could get out. And after having done so, Anakin would pretty much collapse onto the ground. The fight with Momin had been taxing, to say the least. And as for the door to the dark side dimension, Anakin knew that the focusing spires would be easily rebuilt. He didn't need Momin for that. He will bring Padme back, Anakin told himself. And following this, as he lay there on the ground, many thoughts would be going through Anakin's mind. But eventually, his mind would settle on something Momin had said before he was thrown back into the hole he came from. Your master is either ignorant or hoarding knowledge. Momin wasn't lying when he said this. That Anakin could sense. Sidious had lied and betrayed pretty much everyone that ever trusted him, including Padme, Dooku, Maul, the Senate, the Republic, and now him, Anakin would come to realize. Sidious is using him, just like how he used everyone else in his life. Nothing will be achieved if the snake that was Sidious lived. Just like how Momin said, Sidious would always deprive him of the knowledge he requires to save Padme. For Padme to be brought back, Sidious had to go, and he needed to become the Emperor. Anakin would realize and believe. He knew what needed to be done, and with a newfound determination, Anakin would get up and leave the Force Locus. His work on Mustafar will have to wait until Darth Sidious had been dealt with. So a few days later, Anakin Skywalker would arrive on Coruscant, and immediately after arriving in the Imperial capital, Anakin would make his way over to the personal residence of Emperor Palpatine, which by this point was the former Jedi Temple, which Palpatine had turned into an Imperial palace. Anakin, who at this point speaks with the Emperor's voice, would face no resistance as he walked in. And soon enough, Anakin found himself in the former Jedi High Council chamber. The same room where he slaughtered younglings not too long ago. The room which was now Palpatine's personal office. Can you still hear the sounds they made when you cut them down, Lord Vader? Sidious would ask Anakin, referring to the younglings. Receiving no response from Anakin, Sidious would turn around and direct his yellow Sith eyes at Anakin. Anakin would match Sidious's gaze with his own glowing yellow eyes. And then, without saying anything else, Anakin would ignite the Sith Saber he had made with Master Yoda's kyber crystal. So be it, Sidious would say after seeing Anakin do this. And having said so, Sidious would stand up and ignite his own Crimson Saber, and then lunge at Anakin, letting Yoda scream similar to when he faced Mace Windu and the other masters when they came to arrest him not too long ago. Outside the former Jedi High Council chamber, Palpatine's Red Guards would hear lightsabers clashing. Fearing for the Emperor's safety, they would try to get in, but would find the doors immovable, as if something was holding them shut from the other end. Inside, Darth Sidious and Darth Vader would be locked in combat. We could have achieved so much together, you could have been the most powerful Sith ever. It's a pity that you chose weakness, Lord Vader, Sidious would say. Anakin wouldn't say anything in response, instead choosing to use all his strength to attack Sidious. And as the fight went on, Anakin would sense Sidious tiring out. As powerful as he was, Sidious was quite old, and the more tired Sidious got, the less he relied on his lightsaber, eventually fully relying on his strength in the Force to fight Anakin. And so in the end, Sidious would attack Anakin with Force Lightning, Sidious' most powerful ability. Anakin would initially be able to deflect most of Sidious' lightning, but soon it managed to reach his body. And as the lightning coursed through Anakin's body, Sidious felt Anakin's presence in the Force growing stronger much stronger, and moments later, sparks of red force lightning started appearing on the fingertips of Anakin's left hand. To learn the ability of Sith lightning, one has to be attacked with it first. Plagueis had taught Sidious that, and that is exactly what was happening here, although Sidious may not have been doing that intentionally. Anakin, as he was filled with anger and pain, was learning how to channel it in the form of force lightning, specifically red force lightning which was believed to be the strongest form of the ability, something which Plagueis' master, Dark Tenebrous, was said to have possessed. As the lightning coursed through his body, Anakin felt Sidious channeling more of his anger into his force lightning, but Anakin also realized that Sidious was getting weaker. He couldn't keep this up for much longer. And so, as the moments passed by, Anakin's red force lightning began overpowering Sidious's blue lightning until eventually, Sidious was on his knees unable to do anything to fight off Anakin. At this point, Anakin would stop and look at the withered old man who lay before him. Sidious would then try to speak, but by this point in his life, Anakin had heard enough of Sidious. So before Sidious could let out even one word, Anakin would grab Sidious by the throat. Not with the force, but with his robotic right arm. And then Anakin 
would slowly begin crushing Sidious's neck. And then, before the last bit of life could leave Sidious, Anakin would ignite his Sith Saber again and cut Sidious's body in half and drop it. And at this very moment, the doors to the chamber would be pushed open and Palpatine's red guards would burst in with their four spikes and they would see Anakin Skywalker standing over Emperor Palpatine who was in two pieces. What is your purpose? Anakin would ask without even turning around to look at the guards who just walked in. To protect the Emperor of the galaxy, one of the red guards would say with a hint of hesitation not knowing what to say or do. Then I hope you will do a better job protecting me than you did Emperor Palpatine, Hannigan would say a few moments later. And then he would turn around to face the Red Guards, who after a short pause would kneel and say, We won't fail you, Emperor Skywalker. The galaxy is mine, Hannigan would think. Hannigan would then again face away from the guards to direct his attention to the Coruscant skyline. The Emperor was assassinated by a Jedi who infiltrated his residence. Find this Jedi, keep searching till you do. Anakin would order the guards. At this moment, clone troopers would also walk in, but the Red Guards would give them the same orders that Emperor Skywalker gave them. And despite their suspicions, not one person would even attempt to question Emperor Skywalker. And so the Red Guards would leave for the clone troopers to search for this undercover Jedi that killed Emperor Palpatine. And as they did so, Anakin would keep looking at the Coruscant skyline, which looked very beautiful that night. And at this moment, Anakin would also realize that Sidious was the one holding the doors for shut so that the guards could not enter when they fought, right up until he died. Was Sidious trying to kill him, the chosen one, by himself? Was he overconfident or was he trying to save Anakin from legal prosecution once they killed Sidious? Anakin would ponder on this for a few short moments, but he would quickly realize that none of that mattered now. Darth Sidious is gone. The galaxy was his. In the days following this, Anakin would officially be declared the Emperor of the Galaxy and all of the Senate would cheer at this. And in the same session of the Senate, a Jedi would be blamed for the death of Emperor Palpatine. And the Senate would of course blindly believe that as well. Anakin of course would not be present for any of this as he had much more pressing concerns. He needed to get all the forbidden knowledge and holocrons from the Jedi Temple transported to Mustafar. He needed to learn how to bring Padme back through the dark side realm. But when Anakin arrived back on Mustafar, he had a very, very unpleasant surprise waiting for him. His castle, which Darth Mormon had built, which enabled the Force Locust to be opened, was destroyed, along with everything else the Empire had brought to Mustafar. All the clones, the engineers, architects, droids, computers containing Mormon's designs of the castle, all destroyed. So what had happened was that in the original timeline, when the natives had attacked Vader and his castle, Vader was there to fend them off, and he did so only because of the Force Locus, which only he could use. But in this new timeline, due to the work on the castle being completed early, by the time the natives launched their attack, Anakin was off-planet on Coruscant dealing with Sidious. And so the Mustafarians had successfully managed to destroy everything that Anakin and Moomin had built. And now, with Momin and his mask having been thrown into the dark side dimension, Anakin had no way of seeking Momin's counsel on rebuilding the castle. Everything he had built, all the hope he had, was lost. Roughly a week after this incident, almost all the Mustafarians that lived around, the region where Anakin had built his castle, were dead. So in the years following this, many things would happen. Anakin would spend almost all his time trying to rebuild the castle to have Momin built it, with very little success. Moment's secrets disappeared with him, and Anakin had very little to go off of, but he continued his pursuit, not giving up. And as for Anakin's new empire, the little time he spared from his efforts on Mustafar, Anakin directed towards the betterment of the empire. Despite everything he had done, like Padme said, there was good in Anakin, and many of Anakin's actions as emperor would prove Padme right. Anakin would end slavery entirely in the galaxy. He would personally end the Hutt clan on Tatooine, and destroy every single slave owner on that planet. The Sigerian slave empire would burn under Anakin's orders. He would completely eradicate corruption in the empire and the senate, mostly by making some very strong examples of those who broke the law. Suffice to say, due to the harsh but fair rule of Emperor Skywalker, he would come to be loved among the citizens of the empire. As for the rebellion, there wouldn't really be one. The people were happy, Crime was at an all-time low. There was economic prosperity in the empire. Slavery was gone, all thanks to Anakin's new empire. He had indeed brought peace, freedom, justice, and security to his new empire. So anyone rebelling against the empire would be rebelling against 
peace and not tyranny like in the original timeline. And also, as for Project Stardust, which was the Death Star project, Anakin would end this project, citing it as useless and a waste of resources, which it was in this timeline. And even in the original timeline, Vader did always consider the Death Star as a pointless endeavor. And also a side note, in the original timeline, the Death Star destroying Alderaan was one of the reasons why the Rebellion became as strong as it did, so that wouldn't happen here. So essentially, the Rebellion would be almost non-existent in Anakin's new empire. In the end, Anakin would be seen as a benevolent emperor. But as for Anakin himself, there would be no peace. In fact, after dealing with some immediate issues like slavery, Anakin would pretty much resign himself to his work on Mustafar, leaving a trusted group of individuals, the likes of Bail Organa and Mon Mothma, to run the Empire, basically. He trusted them because Padme trusted them. So essentially, the Empire would prosper more than the Republic ever did, with its citizens happier than ever. And also, something else that would happen under Anakin's rule that would have never happened under Sidious' rule would be the prosecution of the Jedi being ended. The reason for this was that Anakin, of course, knew that the Jedi were innocent and that Sidious was lying and manipulating everyone. So, essentially, after Anakin came to his senses after the events on Mustafar, he would order Order 66 to be halted. This would also mark the end of Sidious' Inquisitor program. Also, Bail Organa's suggestion to Anakin that incorporating the Jedi into the Imperial Army would greatly improve their ability to maintain peace would also play a small part in convincing Anakin to stop the Jedi Purge. And so eventually the surviving Jedi would be invited back to Coruscant to serve in the Imperial Army. And many Jedi would take up this offer, but many wouldn't. But even these Jedi, the ones that refused to join the Empire, would be allowed to live in peace in the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Many senators in the Imperial Senate would of course be suspicious of this move, especially since the old Emperor, Emperor Sidious, branded all Jedi as traitors. But Bail Organa and some of Anakin's other advisors would explain to the senators that ordering the execution of every single Jedi for the mistakes of a few Jedi Masters in the Jedi High Council doesn't make sense. Which would convince many senators to stand down. But even if they didn't stand down, they all knew that they couldn't do anything against Emperor Skywalker. Especially given how he was loved by the citizens of the Empire. But as for Anakin, he didn't really care about any of this, even though he felt that he was doing the right thing. But the return of one Jedi in particular would bring Anakin some joy, and this Jedi would be his former apprentice, Ahsoka. But when she returned, Ahsoka had some questions, as did Anakin. Anakin wanted to know why Ahsoka did not show up sooner, to which Ahsoka would say that she did not know what was happening with this new Empire or with Anakin, as she, Ahsoka, had seen Anakin standing with the Emperor over the holonet. Hearing this, Anakin would see that it was now his turn to do some explaining. But he had to be careful. Anakin, of course, did not want to lose Ahsoka as well on top of everyone else that he had lost. And with that in mind, Anakin would say that Chancellor Palpatine, or Darth Sidious, who Anakin had believed to be a friend since childhood, had poisoned his mind into being blinded by the dark side. And then, as Ahsoka listened intently, Anakin would say that Palpatine had everyone fooled and that he used the clone army against the Jedi, even manipulating him, Anakin, into being one of his pawns. How, Anakin? Ahsoka would ask in a concerned tone. He offered to save Padme from death. It was a lie I should have known, but the dark side had blinded me. I couldn't see, I couldn't think. I was helpless, Ahsoka. He couldn't save Padme, and when I found out the truth, I ended Sidious. It was only after Padme's death that I could see past the dark side. As Anakin said this, Ahsoka's mind would go back to when Anakin was under the control of the dark side after one of the Mortis gods, the Sun, had corrupted Anakin. But Ahsoka would also recall how Anakin turned back to the light on Mortis. So here, Ahsoka would believe that Darth Sidious had done something similar to what the Sun did to Anakin on Mortis. Ahsoka would believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the dark side was fully controlling Anakin when he sided with Sidious and that Anakin kills Sidious when the dark side's grip on him failed. And so Ahsoka would not blame Anakin for anything that he did, especially given how on Mortis, even Ahsoka had been turned to the dark side by the sun, during which Ahsoka tried to kill Obi-Wan and Anakin. So Ahsoka knows what the dark side can do to a person, and Ahsoka would not inquire into the details of anything Anakin did while he was under the influence of the dark side. That was an Anakin, Ahsoka told herself. Also, Ahsoka would even blame herself for Anakin's fall to the dark side, because she believes that had she not left the Order and stayed by Anakin's side, she would have been able to help Anakin see through Sidious's lies. And so, because of that as well, Ahsoka would tell herself that she would never again abandon Anakin's side. And Anakin, of course, would not tell Ahsoka of how he slaughtered younglings and how he choked Fatme, which he still believes caused her death. 
But Anakin would confess to Ahsoka that he still has some dark side tendencies and powers that he can use if he really needs to. And that he still has his red Sith lightsaber which he keeps as a reminder of his mistakes. But Anakin would assure Ahsoka that he has everything under control. Which truth or not, Ahsoka would believe. However, Anakin would not tell Ahsoka about the exact nature of his work on Mustafar. Simply telling her that he couldn't stay on Coruscant after what happened to the temple. And also, after some further explaining by Anakin, Ahsoka would see why her master would want to maintain control of the galaxy. Because before the Empire, there was pretty much nothing but injustice and corruption in the galaxy, especially in the Outer Rim, which was not the case under Anakin's rule. So Ahsoka would ultimately join Anakin's Empire, and eventually would become Anakin's second-in-command, military-wise anyways. Ahsoka would eventually be given the rank of Grand Moff, and direct control over the division of the Imperial military, which was led by the former Jedi that joined the Empire. And so, the years would pass by in this manner, with Anakin buried in research into the Force, Ahsoka leading the Imperial army, and Anakin's trusted advisors leading the Imperial policy-making process. Nothing much would change about this for roughly 20 years. And now, let's get back to Luke and Leia on Dagobah. So over the years, Luke and Leia would grow up on Dagobah, and would be trained in the ways of the Force by Yoda and Obi-Wan, who would tell young Luke and Leia everything about the Jedi, the Republic, and how the Sith destroyed the Jedi. But the two Jedi, seeing as how Luke and Leia needed to take out the Sith, their father, wouldn't tell the twins anything about their parents, instead telling them that they were rescued from the Jedi Temple on Coruscant before the Sith could kill them. Luke and Leia would grow up believing this, but Yoda and Obi-Wan, to make sure that the twins stay loyal to the Jedi even if they find out that Anakin was their father, would make the principle of detachment the core aspect of Luke and Leia's training. They should be able to strike Anakin down without flinching, even if they were to find out mere moments prior that Anakin was their father. That was one of the goals of Yoda and Obi-Wan concerning the training of the twins. Obi-Wan was a little unsure of this method of training, but Obi-Wan had always blamed himself to some degree on Anakin's fall to the dark side, and because of this guilt, he never opposed any of Yoda's training methods for Luke and Leia. And so, Luke and Leia would grow up to be perfect Jedi with a very clear goal that would be instilled in them from a very young age. Their goal was to destroy the Sith. Obi-Wan and Yoda would have been in touch with Bail Organa over the years, and through Bail, they would come to know of the death of Darth Sidious and the prosperous nature of the Empire under Anakin. But ultimately, if the Sith existed, the galaxy would never be safe, according to Yoda. Yoda would cite the example of Darth Vitiate to give grounds to his beliefs. Vitiate, or Valkorion, was a Sith Emperor who tried to consume the entire life force of the galaxy to further his own goals. The Sith by their very nature are selfish, Yoda would often say. All they do is for themselves. In the case of Emperor Skywalker, for example, the reason he killed the slave owners had more to do with his own hatred for slavery due to his own upbringing and less to do with the suffering of the slaves themselves, Yoda would say. If Skywalker was left to his own devices, he could end up doing something terrible. This is what Yoda believed, and Obi-Wan too, though Obi-Wan didn't want to believe it. Anakin Skywalker was born of the Force, and his potential in the Force was not masked by anyone else, not even his children. But after nearly 20 years on Dagobah, training every day of their lives in the ways of the Force and a lightsaber combat, Luke and Leia would become extremely powerful Jedi, and upon completing 20 years of training on Dagobah, Yoda, who by this point was very old, would knight Luke and Leia. It was finally time to face Darth Vader, Yoda and Kenobi would decide. So the ultimate plan of the two Jedi was to destroy Anakin and bring back democracy with the help of Bail Organa and his allies, who by the way had the trust of Emperor Skywalker. And another goal they had was for the former Jedi on Coruscant under the control of Grand Moff Tano to be brought back to their roles as peacekeepers rather than soldiers. Eventually, they knew that establishing the Jedi Order to its former glory would take some time, even if Anakin was defeated. But since facing Anakin on both Mustafar or on the Imperial capital would be very risky, the Jedi, along with Bail, had to come up with a sound plan to deal with Anakin, in a place where Anakin would be alone, preferably. And as for Bail betraying Anakin, even though Bail sees what Anakin's new empire has achieved, Bail had also seen what the temple looked like during Operation Nightfall, which was led by Anakin Skywalker. And ultimately, Bail knew that Anakin was a ticking time bomb, and that Yoda was right about him. And so, to draw Anakin out to somewhere where he can be taken on, Bail would share with Yoda and Obi-Wan of Anakin's obsession with knowledge on the Force. Bail, of course, didn't know what exactly Anakin was trying to do on Mustafar, but he did know that Anakin was spending a significant amount of Imperial resources 
Looking for ancient artifacts on distant vaults, many of which had a past connection to the Sith or the Jedi, or both. Bill didn't have all the details on this, but he did know that when something of value was found, Anakin would leave Mustafar along with Grand Moff Tarno and would visit these places, taking with him only a very small crew of clone troopers. This was information that Yoda and Obi-Wan could use. All they had to do was discreetly slip into the Imperial ranks information about an ancient Jedi temple, and Anakin would end up there sooner or later. But the problem was that he would be there with Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka, although not as powerful as Anakin, would still be a formidable threat, Yoda would summarize. But Yoda would also add that the four of them together, Luke, Leia, Obi-Wan and Yoda, had the best chance of taking out Anakin and his former apprentice, Ahsoka Tano. Hearing this, Obi-Wan knew that if Ahsoka had sided with Anakin, she needed to be dealt with, but Obi-Wan would tell Yoda that it is indeed possible that Ahsoka does not know what Anakin did during Order 66 and may genuinely believe that Anakin saved the galaxy while doing nothing wrong. Hearing Obi-Wan raise his opinion, Yoda would say that Obi-Wan might be right. But Yoda would also further add that they will only get one opportunity to destroy the Emperor, and that they cannot prioritize convincing Moff Tano of the truth over destroying the Sith. And in response to this, Obi-Wan would simply nod, realizing that Yoda was right. And so, with all that decided, Yoda would tell Bail of the location of a secret Jedi Temple on a system in the Outer Rim, and the system was Lothal. The temple on Lothal wasn't well known, even within the Order, Yoda would tell Bail. And Bail would say in response that he would pass this information onto the Empire and let Yoda and Obi-Wan know when Anakin leaves for the temple, or rather when Ahsoka leaves Coruscant as Anakin's travels were mostly a mystery to everyone. But he always left with Ahsoka, that they knew. And with their grand plan almost nearing completion, the two masters would tell Luke and Leia that the time has come for them to face the Sith. The two Jedi Knights would be determined to end the Sith and would tell their masters that they are ready. Let's hope we all are, Obi-Wan would think to himself, hearing this. And so, with everything decided, the Jedi Masters and their students prepared for what's to come. Days later, when Mustafar, the Emperor would be notified of an ancient Jedi temple being discovered in the Outer Rim. Eager to learn of the secrets that this temple held, the 42-year-old Emperor Skywalker, who has been ruling his empire in name only for roughly 20 years now, would leave Mustafar, which he rarely did. Over the past 20 years, Emperor Skywalker has been tirelessly trying to rebuild Moment's designs, with very little success. But still, he was persistent, and for that reason, rarely left Mustafar. But as was the case, whenever he left Mustafar to inquire on any new discoveries on the Force, the Emperor took the company of his Grand Moff and former apprentice, Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka had become Skywalker's apprentice when she was only 14 years old, during the Clone Wars, and at this point, the two had known each other for over 23 years. And so, along with Ahsoka, the Emperor would make his way over to Lothal where this new temple had been discovered. After they arrived in Lothal, Imperial forces would direct Ahsoka and Anakin to the temple that was discovered. And shortly after arriving, Ahsoka and Anakin would be joined by the lead Imperial archaeologist of this project, who would tell the Emperor that while they know that the temple exists, mostly below the ground, they haven't been able to find a door. Anakin would then ask how they are sure it exists, to which the archaeologist would say that they scanned the area and discovered that there are large, hollow pockets of space beneath the surface, and that unusual activity was noticed from the temple roughly two days prior. Anakin would see clarification on this unusual activity. To which the archaeologist would tell Anakin and Ahsoka that the temple appeared to have exhibited motion, and that they don't know what caused it. Hearing this, Ahsoka and Anakin would look at each other for a moment, and then they would both proceed towards where the temple is supposedly located, telling the elite archaeologist that they, Anakin and Ahsoka, will need to examine the place alone. The archaeologist would bow and walk away, leaving the Emperor and the Grand Moff to explore the place. And as they approached where the temple should be, as per the scans done by the archaeologist, both Ahsoka and Anakin would feel the presence of the temple through the Force, and as if by instinct, they knew how to access it. They needed the aid of the Force. Anakin would then raise his hand and call upon the Force to lift the temple above ground, and as a result, the temple would start moving, and moments later, an entrance to the temple would become visible following which Anakin and Ahsoka would walk in. Once inside the temple, however, they would sense a presence, or rather, multiple presences, some of which familiar, but not alone, Ahsoka would say, nothing we can't handle, Anakin would say, looking at Ahsoka. And having had this conversation, they would then make their way further into the temple. And as they did so, the presence that they both sensed 
got stronger. And so, they followed it, and eventually they both stood in a large hall, where the presence was the strongest. And the moment Anakin realized who it is they were sensing, Anakin heard multiple lightsabers ignite, and within less than a second, Anakin was attacked by Obi-Wan, Yoda, and two young humans, both wielding blue lightsabers. As for Ahsoka, before she could react, she was met with a very strong force push, most probably from Master Yoda, which sent Ahsoka flying across a large hall she and Anakin were in. But Ahsoka would immediately get back on her feet and would try to make her way back to Anakin, who at this point, as Ahsoka could see, was fighting off four force wielders. Ahsoka too would realize at this moment that two of them were Obi-Wan and Yoda, who she had presumed perished long ago, as Anakin never liked talking about them, especially his former master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ahsoka had many questions in her mind seeing this, but she didn't have time to dwell on any of them. Instead, she directed all her focus towards getting back to Anakin. But seeing Ahsoka approach, one of the younger Jedi, the woman, leapt in front of Ahsoka with the air of the Force and began attacking her, leading Ahsoka away from Anakin, forcing the Emperor to fight three Jedi by himself. And so, within the ancient house of the Lothal Temple, the Emperor of the Galaxy, Anakin Skywalker, fueled by the dark side, fought his old master Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Grand Master of the Fallen Jedi Order Yoda, who looked very old at this point, and a much younger Jedi, who Anakin could sense wanted nothing more than to destroy the Sith. And so, as the fight began, Anakin, with his controlled fury, would wield his red lightsaber in a deadly dance of power and precision. His movements would be a blend of aggression and skill. He would meet his opponents with a relentless barrage of strikes, each one a thunderous clash against the green and blue sabers of the Jedi. Obi-Wan, embodying a calm, almost serene demeanor, counters Anakin's ferocity with his deeply practiced defensive techniques. His every move would be a masterclass in the art of lightsaber combat, worthy of recognition in the Jedi archives. The young Jedi Knight, however, like in the years of his companions, fights with skill beyond his ears, Anakin would see. He would engage Anakin head-on, matching his fury, with their raw yet refined power. And in this young Jedi, Anakin could sense something familiar, yet unfamiliar. But the Emperor had no time to dwell on this. And meanwhile, Master Yoda, small in stature but immense in presence, would be darting around Anakin like a blur. Despite his age, he moves with surprising agility with the aid of the Force, his green saber clashing with Anakin's as he strikes from unexpected angles. As the fight went on, however, Anakin, driven by a growing impatience, would find an opening and create some distance between him and his three foes, following which Anakin would immediately channel his rage into a fearsome display of red force lightning. Yoda and Obi-Wan, though they would valiantly try to deflect it, would be grazed by the potent force of the Sith lightning, sending them both reeling back, which would leave the young Jedi to fight Anakin himself. And seizing this moment, Anakin focuses his assault on the young Jedi Knight who, even by himself, would match the Emperor's skill. But soon enough, with a series of powerful, relentless strikes, Anakin would overwhelm the young Jedi's defenses, and in a decisive and brutal motion, Anakin's saber slices through the air, severing the Jedi's hand, following which the young warrior would collapse, overcome with shock and agony. And then, without a moment's hesitation, Anakin would raise the saber to strike down this young Jedi. But before Anakin could do this, Master Yoda, summoning every last bit of strength he had, would strike Anakin before Anakin, who was distracted by the young Jedi, could react. And in a swift motion, the blur that was Yoda would take Anakin's left hand, rendering Anakin's ability to use Force Lightning mute. And immediately following this, Yoda would go for Anakin's head, but the pain from losing his left arm would actually fuel the darkness within Anakin. And before Yoda could reach his head, Anakin would dodge and would call his red saber to his robotic right arm and defend Yoda's strikes. So this duel between the one-handed Anakin and Yoda would go on for a few short moments, until Yoda, sensing another opening, would again try to go for Anakin's head. But Anakin, anticipating this move, would swiftly counter, delivering a fatal blow to the 900-year-old Jedi Master. Yoda crumbles to the ground, his body pierced by a lightsaber powered by his own corrupted kyber crystals. And as Anakin watched, Yoda would vanish into the Force. This would momentarily confuse Anakin. But quickly bringing his attention back to the situation at hand, Anakin would prepare to deliver the finishing blow to the young and defeated Jedi. But before Anakin's Sith saber could touch the Jedi, Obi-Wan's voice would pierce the large temple halls. Anakin, he is your son, Obi-Wan said. Anakin's saber would halt mid-air, mere inches from the young Jedi's face. A mix of shock, disbelief, and a dawning realization would wash over Anakin's face. He had sensed something about this Jedi and the one who was with him, 
Obi-Wan wasn't lying, Anakin would realize. And then, without deactivating his lightsaber, the Emperor would activate his comm link and order his troops to enter the temple through the door that was left open when Ahsoka and Anakin walked in. Prior to this, elsewhere in the temple, Ahsoka Tano clashes with the other young Jedi, a woman with a vibrant blue saber. Their fight is a whirlwind of color and motion. Ahsoka's twin white blades move in a graceful yet lethal manner, which was masked by the young Jedi's precise and powerful strikes. The sounds of their sabers colliding would reverberate through the halls of the ancient temple. And as the fight drew on, Ahsoka would realize that this Jedi was powerful beyond her age. She showed no fear, no anger, just a calm, focused determination on the task at hand. A true Jedi, Ahsoka would tell herself. And had it not been for her training under Anakin and access to pretty much all the knowledge the Jedi has on lightsaber combat, which mostly came from the over 25,000 year old droid Hu Yang, the Jedi may have beaten her, Ahsoka would think. But due to her extensive training, Ahsoka was going toe to toe with her foe. They were evenly masked, each looking for an opening in the other's defenses. But then Ahsoka felt something, a shift in the force. Someone had died, and it wasn't Anakin. Ahsoka didn't know if the Jedi she was fighting felt the shift, but even if she did, it didn't seem to affect her, Ahsoka would notice. And so, their duel went on. Until Ahsoka felt Anakin approaching. She didn't have his saber activated, and he was also missing an arm, Ahsoka noted. As Anakin's presence drew near, the young Jedi's concentration faltered for just a moment, and Ahsoka, seizing this opportunity, disarms her opponent with a swift, calculated move, severing the hand in which the Jedi held her lightsaber. And as a result, the Jedi's saber, still gripped by her severed hand, fell to the ground, its light extinguished. And immediately following this, bone troopers would march into the temple hall, and apprehend the Jedi. And as for Anakin, he would then look at the severed hand of his daughter lying on the floor. He would then walk over and recover the lightsaber that her severed hand held, admiring its make. In the days following this incident, although the Empire would continue its march forward as if nothing had changed, several things would happen to several people. Obi-Wan Kenobi, after his capture of Lothal, would not be executed by Emperor Skywalker. Instead, by Anakin's orders, Obi-Wan would be placed inside of a specially designed prison cell on Mustafar. And as for why Anakin wouldn't want to kill Obi-Wan right then and there, well, Anakin knew that Obi-Wan could answer a lot of the questions he had. And further, Emperor Skywalker would also realize that he could kill Obi-Wan whenever he wanted to, now that Obi-Wan is on a prison on Mustafar. So basically, Anakin wanted to know everything that Obi-Wan knew before killing Obi-Wan. And the Emperor figured that the best place to extract this information from Obi-Wan would be Mustafar. But another reason for keeping Obi-Wan on Mustafar was to stop Ahsoka from meeting with Obi-Wan. Because Anakin, even at this point, doesn't want Ahsoka knowing what Obi-Wan knows about what Anakin did during Order 66. And so, after Obi-Wan was brought to his prison cell on Mustafar, Anakin would visit his old master and ask Obi-Wan if the twins are indeed his children. Yes, Anakin, they are. Luke and Leia. Padme named them before she... Obi-Wan would stop. So, by this point in his life, Anakin had acknowledged and accepted that it was he and he alone responsible for Padme's death. And because of that, Anakin did not blame Obi-Wan for what happened to Padme. Obi-Wan could never kill her. Anakin knew this. So, as a response to Obi-Wan, Anakin would say the following. You stole them from me. Anakin would scream, his eyes now glowing yellow. To which Obi-Wan would immediately say that he, Obi-Wan, couldn't take them to the man who killed their mother. Hearing this, Anakin would stay silent for a long moment, his Sith eyes disappearing as he did so. Do they know about me? Anakin would then ask. To which Obi-Wan would say that they don't, and that they only know him as a Sith who destroyed the Jedi and now rules the galaxy. Hearing this, Anakin would begin accusing Obi-Wan of lying and manipulating his children. To which Obi-Wan would stand up and ask, Again, Anakin, should I have told them of how their father murdered younglings and then their own mother? Hearing this would again anger Anakin, but without saying anything, he would leave the cell. Anakin, Obi-Wan would say in a pleading tone as Anakin left, Don't hurt them. They only did what we told them to do. Hearing this, Anakin would stay where he was, silent. But then, a short moment later, he would proceed to walk away, leaving Obi-Wan to look on as Anakin disappeared into the dark. So not long after this, Anakin would leave Mustafar, and head on over to Coruscant, which is where Luke and Leia were transported to. And so, after arriving on Coruscant, Anakin would confront his children, who at this moment were being kept inside of a cold, stark room deep within an Imperial prison on Coruscant, which is where the meeting between Anakin Skywalker and his children would unfold. Emperor Skywalker, powerful and imposing in his dark attire, would stand before Luke and Leia. And then, as the two looked on, Anakin would reveal the truth to them. He is their father. But Luke and Leia, trained as Jedi since birth, 
would show no surprise or any form of emotional response to this revelation. But Anakin would keep watching his children, hoping for a hint of a connection or a familial bond or something, but he would find nothing. Nothing but a cold, distant acknowledgement. And at this moment, a stark realization would dawn upon Anakin. Despite his revelations, which even reveal some of the lies they were told from birth, Luke and Leia's steadfast loyalty to the Jedi Order remains unaltered. Anakin would understand now, more than ever, that their upbringing under Yoda and Obi-Wan has profoundly shaped their beliefs and values. These Jedi teachings, which he himself once followed and then rejected, have become the foundation of the identities of his two progeny. Anakin sees in Luke and Leia the embodiment of the Jedi principle of detachment. He recognizes that for Luke and Leia, their commitment to the Jedi way transcends mere lineage. It is a deep-seated conviction, a path they have chosen to walk, shaped by years of guidance and mentorship from Yoda and Obi-Wan. And in this moment, Anakin comes to a painful understanding. Luke and Leia's allegiance to the Jedi Order is not a product of their training. It is a choice that represents their beliefs and the life they know, a path fundamentally different from his own. Disheartened, Anakin will leave the interrogation room, understanding that the gap between him and his children, widened by years of Jedi indoctrination, might never be bridged. He is their father, but to them, he is just another part of the Empire they have sworn to defeat. And so, ultimately, the meeting between Anakin and his children ends with a silent, unspoken acknowledgement of this divide. But even still, despite this, Anakin didn't want his children dead. But he couldn't just allow them to leave either, so the Emperor found a different way to deal with them. So later, after meeting with his progeny, Anakin would meet with someone else, Bail Organa. Anakin had of course figured out by this point that Bail had a hand in the ambush that took place on Lothal. Only a handful of people knew of Anakin and Ahsoka's travels, Bail being one of them. And on top of that, it was Bail Organa who brought Padme's body to Naboo after claiming that she was abandoned on Polis Massa. So given all this information, for the chosen one to figure out that Bail Organa had a hand in everything would be pretty easy. And so when he met with Senator Organa, Anakin fixed Bail with a piercing gaze. Senator Organa, he began, you've been a loyal servant to the Empire for almost two decades now, but even the most loyal can harbor secrets. Bail, though maintaining a composed exterior, felt a chill run down his spine. She knew the dangerous game he's been playing, hating the Jedi. And now he stood before the most powerful being in the galaxy. Anakin would then begin slowly circling Bail, his presence alone suffocating. You've been a guardian to certain individuals of interest, Anakin continued his tone ominous. Luke and Leia, my progeny, Anakin would say, a veiled accusation that left no room for misunderstanding. Bail, however, remained silent, his mind racing. He had always known that this day might come, but the reality of facing Anakin's wrath was far more daunting than he had ever imagined. And despite Bail maintaining a calm exterior, Anakin would at this moment feel the fear emanating from his trusted advisor of 20 years. But after a long pause, however, Anakin would say the following. You will resign from your position on my council. His voice now a firm decree. Return to Alderaan, take the twins with you. They will live under your roof, under the watchful eyes of my Imperial Red Guards. Hearing this, Bale's heart would sink. This is not just a dismissal, it's a sentence to a gilded prison. But despite this realization, Bale would simply nod, understanding the gravity of his new role as essentially the warden to the children that he had once hoped would be the galaxy's salvation. And then Anakin would lean in closer his voice dropping to a whisper that carries a chilling finality. If a word of this arrangement or of their true parentage reaches anyone, I will not only hold you responsible, Bail, but I will also ensure that Aldron feels the consequences of your betrayal. The threat is clear, and the implications horrifying. Bail knew this. And as for why Anakin would let Bail live, well, reflecting on the two decades under Bail's effective governance, Anakin acknowledged the prosperity and stability Bale's leadership brought to the Empire. This realization by Anakin would weigh heavily against Bale's betrayal. And crucially, Anakin also remembers Padme's deep trust in Bale. This trust, coupled with his recognition that Bale's actions were shaped by the Jedi's influence and his beliefs in doing what he thought was right, tempers Anakin's response. And so, in honoring Padme's memory and acknowledging Bale's role in the Empire's success, Anakin chooses leniency, sparing Bale. And also, another aspect of Anakin's decision to spare Bale was that Anakin knew that Bale cared for Luke and Leia. And Anakin, even though he realizes that his children want him dead, wanted Luke and Leia to be placed under the care of someone who actually cared for them. 
so that's another reason why Anakin chooses to spare Bail. But in the end, after Obi-Wan was made prisoner and Luke and Leia were sent away, Anakin resumed his research on Mustafar. However, not long after the incident of Lothal and the aftermath of said incident, Grand Moff Tano would arrive on Mustafar to meet with the Emperor. Officially, her visit was related to a potential alliance with the Chist Ascendancy, but there was more that weighed on her mind. Asuka knew that Anakin was withholding details about the recent attack on his life, and she sought answers. After discussing the strategic implications of an alliance with the Chiss, Asuka turned the conversation towards the recent confrontation. Why did Master Yoda and Obi-Wan do that? Did they not see the prosperity of the Empire? Did they not realize that the downfall of the Jedi was caused by Darth Sidious and not you? This is what Ahsoka would ask Anakin, her tone a mixture of confusion and concern. Anakin, gazing out the fiery landscape of Mustafar, pondered his response. He knew he had to tread carefully, ensuring Ahsoka's continued loyalty while keeping the true identity of the twins concealed. Yoda and Obi-Wan were blinded by their allegiance to a flawed Jedi philosophy. Anakin began, his voice firm. They could not accept the changes necessary for peace and order in the galaxy. Ahsoka listened intently, though her expression betrayed her struggle to reconcile this with her understanding of her former mentors. And the other two Jedi? Ahsoka probed further. There were no one, mere pawns, manipulated by the Jedi. Anakin replied, a hint of disdain in his voice. Trained from birth to oppose, but they do not understand it's tragic, really, how the Jedi Order continues to use its members for its own agenda. Ahsoka nodded slowly, processing his words. She still had doubts, but Anakin's conviction and the respect she held for him made her push those doubts aside. What will become of them now? Ahsoka asked, referring to the captured Jedi. They will be kept under my watch. They are no longer a threat, Anakin stated, turning back from the window to face Ahsoka as he said this. The conversation then shifted back to official matters, but Ahsoka's visit to Mustafar left her with more questions than answers. She remained loyal to Anakin, yet seeds of doubt, however small, had been planted in her mind. Anakin was keeping something from her. This thought would have now entered her mind. But Ahsoka did not confront Anakin with any of these thoughts. And eventually, Ahsoka got up to leave. And as Ahsoka was almost out the door, Anakin, for some reason, impulsively called out her name. Ahsoka, she paused, looked back at him with questioning eyes. For a fleeting moment, Anakin wrestled with the idea of unburdening all his secrets to Ahsoka. But realizing that Ahsoka was really the only real family he had left, Anakin reconsidered, not wanting to risk damaging his connection with her. And after a short moment of reflection, he looked at her and simply said, It's nothing. Ahsoka then gave a nod, slightly puzzled but respectful, and left. Filling the room, Anakin stood in with silence. And Anakin stood in the silence, watching through the window as Ahsoka's ship left the fiery landscape of Mustafar. And once she was out of sight, Anakin brought his mind back into focus. There was work to be done. He had to recover moment's knowledge and bring Padme back. And so, with a renewed sense of purpose, the Emperor returned to his work. So from this point on, the story could go several different ways. Anakin might become successful in rebuilding moment's designs, or he might never be successful and instead would decide to, like Darth Vitiot, consume the life force of the entire galaxy to gain enough power to bring Padme back. At which point Ahsoka might finally leave Anakin, and with the help of Luke and Leia, would go up against Anakin. She might also lose her white lightsabers during this process, because of which Ahsoka would end up using a yellow lightsaber, which could be what Anakin saw in that dark side dimension. But like I said, that is just one possibility. What do you think would happen? Anyways, before you leave, if you have the time, do check out my Patreon for $1 or more a month for early access to videos and exclusive content which wouldn't appear on the main channel for months. Link should be in the description. Anyways, that's it. Have an awesome rest of the day or night and goodbye. I will see you in the next video.